This vlog's gonna suck. I didn't really record a whole lot this week, so at the end, I'm gonna play a seed starting video that I made for Justin's uh, Justin Rose member area. the driveway open so we can run the water lines underneath and put those pieces back on top and then uh, run the wire through okay the pipes are in and we just covered it up and tamped it so we'll see how the concrete works it ain't perfect but it's gonna settle um, into here and all that so it's it's cool we'll just fix it when we need to so all the tunnels and stuff did all right through the storm so that's good um like some ends are really worn out like this one but it was a big storm and it rained uh neighbor phil's rain gauge said three inches a little over three inches so our rain gauge blew over remember that trench I was filling with the BCS. Yeah, it rained so hard that it washed all of the soil out of it. It's still moving water right now. Uh, it's always something. That's insane, man. Well, that's North Carolina clay for you. It's basically a bathtub. Uh, I took the trencher over it when it was dry, and yeah, I guess I really, maybe we should do pottery instead of growing vegetables. Just got a pallet of chicken feed. I got um, some stuff for pasture poultry, some starter feed, crumbles, and then just for when they get bigger, I have regular laying pellets for them, which is like high protein. And then we can also use that for the egg layers. We did pre-orders for pastured um, chickens, like meat chickens, and then offered a lower price if people came to help process. So they get to learn how to do it so they can then raise their own. So we'll see how it goes. Were we like a month late on the, or the chicken order got pushed back a month? Yeah, I got delayed by the hatchery. Yeah. Um, like four weeks, but the feed will still be good by yeah. then, and they'll go through it quickly. Yeah, we're good. It's a pretty big pile. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> we'll go through it quick though. Okay, getting the timer stuff hooked up here. These aren't really that good, so don't buy them. But yeah, we'll probably eventually go to like a different setup at some point. Yeah. But this is just what we had. Yep. And, using uh, what we got yeah and that's how it all is so and i'm gonna go over how it is but know that just use what you have <laughs> now that we can actually irrigate stuff it changes um what you would use so with them running Sandy and I did some transplanting today. So we got a bed of Salanova lettuce and then a bed of just like gem lettuce and head lettuces. And then we had another volunteer, Helen and Janie came and we did a lot of composting and broad forking and raking back in plot seven. So a lot of work, a lot of work done by Janie. She's 14 and she uh, shoveled 10 wheelbarrow fulls of compost so awesome yeah jane is a beast she is this is the cover crop uh red clover or crimson clover red clover whatever you want to call it and uh winter rye the bees are really liking it yeah it like just started to flower last week so i'm sure the bees are very happy <laughs> the hives 
are right there. So, real close. We gotta come in here and prune up these tomatoes too, but there's the first bloom. If these tomatoes went through, they had it really rough. Um, coming out of the basement, and then we had like three 85 degree days right away that weren't forecasted. It was really hot, it's been super windy. We probably had about 20 or 30 tomatoes get ripped out by the wind. Just these, these massive gusts that come through and just whip in the end of the tunnels here. And I mean, there ain't much you can do if you don't want it to be 100 degrees in here. Like there's still spinach and beets in here too. That's part of the balance and the challenge. If any of you guys are transplanting tomatoes here soon from your house, you'll get this whitish look. And that's like sun scald, sunburn. The new foliage that comes out will be fine. It'll adjust. Pretty quick. This dang irrigation project is putting us like, it's so much work to get done and then to try and keep up with everything else at the same time. It's crazy. But I am uh, putting another irrigation station over there. I'll, uh, that's gonna be like this one. But it's gonna be for the back three plots and probably the squash plot up there. Yeah, all right, the, uh, that's it. I gotta get some brackets and move them around, but yeah, it ain't perfect, but it does work. I'm a function over fancy person, so it doesn't really bother me, but I do need to mount them correctly. And we need to get another timer for over there. All those, one of the, there's three hoses coming out of each. They're different, they call them stations. We consider them zones. And so each one is a tunnel or four wobblers. I gotta come through and clean all these hoses up. Uh, you bury them in the tunnel and just straighten up and neaten them up around. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens out there. <laughs> so definitely frosted last night and today's harvest day. So hopefully tomatoes did all right. I'm gonna check those in a little bit. And yeah, we got salad, collards, carrots, fennel, bunching onions, uh, arugula, kale, turnips, uh, spinach. I always try and let this tunnel heat up in the morning before I open the door because that prolonged cold is what will get the tomatoes. They look fine to me. It's foggy in here, you can see how warm it is. What do you think? This is gonna be really cool. My friend Pete from uh, Green Dreams called me this morning and he's setting up a agroforestry deal at his place. So for he's in Florida, so it's different. So he's using like fruit trees and stuff like that and moringas and all types of really cool plants. But for us, and grasses. So this is a whole like, it's called Syntropical, but it's where the grass feeds the trees. So they'll put the trees in a row and then in between the rows they'll have grass and then they'll mow the grass. Well, they actually cut it so it's a stalk and then they set it over the root zone of the trees and then that becomes a mulch that takes a long time to break down, but it holds moisture. It's more common in tropical areas. But what we're gonna try and do here, because this is an area we can't really build any beds, we're gonna um, do something similar, but with trees that will do good in North Carolina. And then instead of using grass, we'll use comfrey along the edges, because that's an accumulator, so it, the leaves are full of nutrients. And then even in between, the comfrey and the trees we could direct seed like clover or something to fix nitrogen just a cover crop just to fill the space in the area uh, totally no plan no design we're just gonna go and try and plan it out see what happens all right these are persimmon trees with seeds from our neighbors tree that uh, is really productive these are figs from Nick at Paul Gauchi's place in Washington these are elderberries. Um, some are cuttings from here and some are from John Angela in Oklahoma. The comfrey is from John Angela in Oklahoma, heirloom permaculture. We're also gonna be putting in service berries. These are my favorite trees. What's going on? 
Trying to get it there. So we thought that was a black widow at first, but it doesn't have the markings. But they'll hide under the silage tarps yeah, a and, lot. And like the sandbags, I've almost grabbed them before. Yeah. I mean, if you get bit though, you just bite them back. I heard that's supposed to work. Sounds about right. We're gonna lay out this comfrey and then determine uh, where we put these tree and shrub species at. Look at this cover crop. Trying to get it laid out here. So I went through and dug the holes and now Tori's planting. Probably gonna leave enough space in between the trees and the comfrey that we can um, direct seed clover or wildflowers or some kind of uh, annual ground cover deal. And then take one of the black silage tarps we use for covering the beds with the growing beds. And then when we're done with that crop or whatever, weed whack it, whatever, and then tarp it and let it sit, kill the weeds. Let's we'll see how this works. This isn't super technical. We're not trying to be people that act like we know what we're doing on YouTube when really we don't. Or that we just watched the video and then now we know everything about it. This will serve as a spot for pollinators and birds and things like that. I mean, at any point in time, we can come in here, transplant those trees when they're small. It's really easy to do. Uh, even when they're bigger, it's still kind of easy. Or just cut them out, plant something different there. You gotta experiment on your days off, you know? Is it recording? Yeah. Alright, we're gonna go. Can you see the cedar? Now, okay. Can you now? Mm -hmm. We're just going to go all out on this thing now and seed some clover. So we're going to do like a, what would be a garden bed in between the comfrey and the trees. That way it starts fixing nitrogen for all the plants. And we'll see what happens. in point just went to move a different tarp that is up towards the road more and there is a real black widow I almost grabbed her but luckily I saw her what's up guys gonna go over seed starting here so with the uh, virus deal you know it's just gonna happen um, this video is for Justin's member area and I'm gonna try and give you guys uh, an insight into the way that we start them and do them. Um, we have a market garden that we do full time. Uh, it's the first, first month we did it together like we're making a living off of it. So seed starting is a pretty big thing for us. And yeah, so anything that I, th I'm gonna try and go through, you know, like what you'd see in the plants and then what that is or why it's happening that way when you start them, you'll know ahead of time that I need more of this or more of that or things like that. So, and the whole thing is to do it cheap. So, where to get seeds? We get about all of our seeds from Johnny Select Seeds. Um, you can go on their website, it's really awesome. And in their catalogs, they have a lot of information on how to grow them. Um, I mean, everything is in here. So, like for carrots. So here's Purple Elite, a seed packet from them. Um, on the back of it, it tells you, on the back of it, it tells you what the seed needs seeding rates, uh, the culture, which is like the environment that it needs, and then how to harvest diseases and pests. So all that information is on here. And then from here, either books or Google is the way to find out more information. But so let's say like choose deep, well-drained soils with a pH of six to 6.8, uh, loosen the soil, so in early spring, I mean, all that stuff, it's all on there. It gives you a good idea of what the seed company thinks about and wants you to know about as the grower. This is the Salanova. 
That's the Salanova here. And we grow this all year. The seeds are pretty expensive, but they're pelleted. You get about 100% germination every time. Uh, we sell this every week. It's our biggest seller. So you don't have to buy that one. I'm just using that as an example that we use pelleted seeds for Salanova lettuce. And we're going to start using it for celery. Celery is a pain to get to germinate. But um, depending on what you want to grow, it's going to be like related to your area. So in the catalog, it will also tell you different things about the, the seeds. Um, sometimes they'll say, or it'll tell you different things about the seeds and you'll see like uh, fungal issues, pests, things like that you can do. Um, sometimes they'll have soil requirements um, like this one, this uh, spinach, high resistance to downy mildew. Races one through ten. Just think that's a fungal, that's a fungal disease that affects the leaves. So, if you're in a uh, area where it rains a lot, but it doesn't dry up quick, or if you're in a shaded garden area that holds moisture and you don't have a lot of wind blowing through, you might look into that one because it's resistant. It's more resistant to the fungal issues that will always be present. So your your pests and your fungal issues will always be present no matter what. Now, um, just because it's resistant doesn't mean that it's it's resistant all around. It still could have some issues, but uh, you also have to look when it tells you on the seed packet the culture of what the plant wants. You have to try and meet what the plant wants as much as possible, and. For a lot of different places in the country that's really different like we get a lot of rain here we can get two inches of rain in one storm um, we can go through a six week drought where it's 90 degrees every day uh, we can get a foot of snow in one day we can get seven inches of rain in one day so um, a lot of stuff to think about but it's not that scary one of the things to remember too is the plant wants to live so you always have that on your side when you get the seeds, um, we store these in our closet. Could also store them in the cooler here. And if you are gonna store them in a cooler or a cooler setting, like we store spinach and Swiss chard in our refrigerator. Um, the seed rep from the seed company was actually here and he told me, your cooler temperature, so ours is 38, call it 40 for easy math. Your cooler temperature at 40 needs to be at 60% humidity those two numbers, your your humidity in the in your cooler plus the temperature you're keeping at needs to equal 100, and that is the ideal way to store your seeds. Uh, I don't know the humidity in there, and our clo <clears throat> our closet stays the same temperature all the time. It's around 70, so we just do that. All right, so gonna get into seed how you actually seed stuff, but before that, gonna go over the um, Kind of like the science behind the seed to make this make more sense. So this was my first class in college, plant science. Uh, this is a good book. I look back at it quite a bit. It's called Botany for Gardeners. Um, so here we go. When you, so your seeds are like tiny plants. They're just ready to get water basically. And anything that you're really going to order, you don't need to put through this a period of like scratching or heat or cold or anything. Most of that's already taken care of. Um, so you'll see in this picture that the seed isn't that far in the ground. So take your seed size and don't plant it any deeper than the width of the seed. The reason for that is the seeds only have a certain amount of energy in them and they need to push the root out first, that, and they need to push that root out and get and start establishing itself and then it needs to bring itself up and then um, it has cotyledons which are just like energy storage and the cotyledons will get the plant established 
and then it will create true leaves that start making food for the roots and then the plant can take care of itself. So a seed is like a mini plant with a storage with storage tanks, the cotyledons, to get itself established. Now the reason that's important is because if you're seeding something in here and you put it too deep or maybe you don't you leave it exposed completely, it's likely to dry out and not be able to have that period of time where it needs to take in water. When the seed takes in water, that's what triggers it to actually germinate. That's the biggest thing. Now for germination, you're gonna have you're gonna need water temperature and occasionally light for some things but water and temperature are going to be the biggest factors you'll need so you let's just go through it here so but i would never transplant carrots only direct seed them but just for the sake of showing um so carrots are really small seeds so you got your flat here just a little divot in there and then drop the seed and just cover it or you can fill the whole thing make little divots if you stack two of these on top of each other and then put your seeds in and take a little bit and just go over top a little bit that's what we do for pretty much everything and that gives it a light layer on top that's easy for the seed to push through while also holding the moisture in next to the seed. And the way that we start our seeds is we'll actually start them out here in the garage. We'll seed everything out here in the garage and then water it really heavy right outside here and then take it to the basement. The reason we take it to the basement is because the basement is a stable temperature and there's no intense sunlight, there's no wind, there's no uh, rain that could wash the seed out if it floods it so you have the stable temperature that is what you really need to get seeds to germinate so like your lettuces uh let's see your lettuces like this tray of lettuce was germinated in the basement that's a hundred like a hundred percent germination and i think it's three or four days for these guys to to start popping up and you can do warm season crops in your basement or put them on a fridge uh, with a little bit of heat um, but the best you want a stable area of temperature to start your seeds you know a corner in a garage maybe could work even in a crawl space you know it's dark it's, it's moist it's a stable temperature and uh, we've done it before it works if you have an issue that you can't um, get down to check it and water it very often you can cover this with like you know even something like this old bag just get this wet water these get this wet put it on top of here just to hold the moisture in uh, occasionally we'll use silage tarps in the field for direct seeding crops and or we'll use mats just uh, uh, like standing mats in the basement just to hold the moisture if something takes a long time to germinate it's good to have something there that holds the moisture now when they start germinating and they push the root out and you see this you'll see this above the soil the little white part sticks out that's when you need to move it to a place where there's sunlight or a grow light and a grow light we don't use them a whole lot and I don't know a whole lot about them a lot of them are different uh, I would get a full spectrum and a full spectrum light and uh, keep it probably three four inches from your seed flat and see how the plant responds so after germinates it's best to get it outside into a real environment like the environment that it's going to live in the longer you keep it in the basement or a sheltered environment the worse the worse off it's going to be adjusting to the actual climate like we had tomatoes in the basement for a long time I put them out and now it's 85 degrees outside and they're getting roasted by the sun wasn't supposed to be that hot but that's the game you play they'll probably be okay but it just the way it is so 
If you're using grow lights and you're growing inside, you want a seed flat like this. And what you need is you need a fan. So you have a fan blowing on the plants. You have the grow light and uh, you can mist them. You want to mimic your outdoor conditions. So the fan mimics the wind, which when you have plants that grow up and they're, they're leggy and they get real tall, like a lot of times you'll see people start seeds next to a window and they'll be like this tall when they should be this tall. It's because there's no wind and they're just reaching for the light. So they need that intense light and they need the wind at the beginning to get themselves established correctly in, the, in your soil. Now, if you're going, um, if you're going, to, if they germinate and you're taking them outside, uh, we use our cat tunnels, which are really growing tunnels for um, our nursery, and we want to build an actual nursery. But in the meantime, what we've done is just set set up shelves right outside of the garage, and water them first thing in the morning. Make sure they always stay moist. And then if there's ever a heavy rain coming or a thunderstorm, just bring them in the garage or shelter them somehow. So if you don't have time or resources to build a nursery setup, your next best bet is to just leave them outside. Or you can put them under a tree too, provided they get a good amount of sunlight. And so there's shelter there. You want shelter, you don't want um, you don't want exposure to the heavy rains that will wash the nutrients out of your potting soil and then it will stress the seedlings and then the seedlings will be susceptible to pests and fungal issues so you want to baby them like these are babies these are uh four weeks old i think and then they'll go in the field and then by that time they should be strong enough just to take care of themselves and it'll be all right but so you got Building a nursery, which you can do a simple A-frame style, just, you know, putting two, like, using just some plastic like this here to help cover it. Um, if you can find old greenhouse plastic, maybe if you go to a nursery or a garden center and ask them if they have any old greenhouse plastic, uh, you can get it for free. Build a little A-frame uh, deal and just, you just want to shelter them. That's the biggest thing. Uh, exposing seedlings to intense sun, uh, heavy rain is not going to be not going to end well. I know because we've messed it up. The more you can baby them from seeding to transplanting, the better off you'll be. One thing you can do with your seedlings is you can foliar feed them. So you can get uh, like we'll use Neptune's Harvest seaweed mix, and it's just a NPK solution with some micronutrients of so mostly just nitrogen and you hit it on the leaves and it takes it in and they just respond well to it. There's instructions on the back of all foliar feeds that'll tell you what to do. And for seedlings it's good to go at about half rate. So that means if it says an ounce per gallon, do a half ounce per gallon. Because those those foliar feeds can actually burn your plants. If I didn't say it, there are cheap greenhouses you can get little nurseries on Amazon. So some things we've noticed in our seedlings, um, if you have a green leaf and it's yellow in the middle of the veins, that's probably a nutrient deficiency. Um, if it's got plenty of water but it's looking yellow, that's probably too much water so the, the roots are um, drowning. Um, obviously wilt, we all know what that is. You can get pests like we had cabbage root maggots on our seedlings so if you see a seedling that's like looking weird or generally it'll be a whole flat but um you see a seedling that's looking weird pull it out and inspect it and see if there's anything on the roots or what the roots look like transplanting um since i have this in my hand i'll go over transplanting uh this one's ready to go it's just the roots are full around the whole thing and um, a lot of times when you can just pop them out like that real easy that's another sign they're ready that's what you want because it's easy to transplant them fast um, if I let these go too long they'll likely yellow and they'll yellow because 
they'll they'll get what's called root bound. So they'll grow their roots out. They'll get all the nutrients out of the potting soil, and they'll be against the uh, against the plastic. And get so hard and so tight against there, it doesn't allow water through to the bottom roots. So, since I said that, I'll bring up you can you can bottom water these guys too, which means you have a, this in a tray of some sort, and you put water in the tray, and set this in the water, and then the water will soak up up the roots to the plant. That's it's called capillary action. So, uh, if you want to learn more about that, just Google it. There's tons of stuff. Now, a soil box, we don't do much with soil box just because, I mean, this is 128 plants. I don't want to make 128 soil box. Uh, at any given time, we probably have like three to 4,000 plants out in our tunnel ready to go. That's a lot of soil box to make, so this is more efficient for us. Not saying I don't like soil box, just that we don't do them. Transplanting. Um, you take these guys out and you want to make sure they're really heavily watered. Uh, poke a hole in the soil, stick it in the hole, and then just cover it up and water it. Make sure you water it really heavy after you plant it because it's going from your baby setup to out in the field, exposed, more intense sunlight, all those things. And it needs the water to start to go out and get established. Alright, so in, in uh, recap here. You're, you need a stable temperature with moisture to get the seeds to germinate. You need, uh, after they germinate, you need actual sunlight and mimicking the conditions outside. So if you're doing it inside, you need grow lights and you need a fan. Um, putting them in a nursery of some sort to, to uh, shelter them from heavy rain events and just crazy weather. You know, I don't know what everybody has on their own property to do this, but like I said, if you go to a garden center and ask for some old greenhouse plastic, it could be uh, left around or something like that, or the cheap greenhouses on Amazon, or um, under a tree canopy, it could even be a sheltered area. Um, I know there's there's a nursery here that I go and get one gallon pots from and he he has thousands of them he just gives them to me for free so that's that's nice but like you know garden centers nurseries if there is a farm most farms run pretty cheap but garden centers and nurseries will be a bit more wasteful just the retail model is the way it is um, you can ask those guys for you know supplies to get your greenhouse plastic pots, old seed flats, things like that. And then building out your nursery setup, whatever it may be. You could do a lean-to off of another building or even just leaving them outside during the day, covering them up in the garage or something at night. You just need to really baby them. I'm gonna have Tori go over the microgreens real quick because she does them for us. I find it really annoying. Um, she'll explain microgreens. So if you guys are trying to grow your own food, you don't have a lot of land, Microgreens are a great way to um, get your own nutrition cheap. Um, you can put it, microgreens with about everything you eat. You put them in soups, put them in salads. Uh, you can eat them just raw, they're pretty good. Uh, so we'll do that. Hey guys, so I've been doing all the microgreens um, for the farm here and I do them every week. And right now I'm about doing 20 trays a week. And mostly I do peas, sunflower shoots, radishes, and some like kale and broccoli and stuff like that. So I use these um, 10 by 20 trays with the holes in the bottom. They're from Bootstrap Farmer. Yep, so they get good drainage here. And when I fill them with potting soil, I'll fill it almost to the top so that when I go to harvest them, I get a nice clean cut and I'm not cutting any soil out of here but it's still enough soil to grow. So for the bigger seeds like the peas and the sunflowers, I will soak overnight the night before. I usually do all my soaking on Sunday nights and then I'll plant all the micros on Monday and by the end of the week they are ready. So by Friday they're ready. And so I'll soak them for overnight and then in the morning I'll come out and I'll just for the peas I do nine ounces of dry seed per tray 
For the sunflower shoots, I'll do four and a half ounces per tray. For the radishes, it's about 40 grams per tray. And then for your broccoli and kale, it's going to be about 16 grams per tray. And that's dry seed weighed out. And so when I go to spread them out in the microgreen flats, I'll just try and get them out as evenly as possible just by kind of shaking them out onto the tray. If there's any spots that are ever too dense, I'll just use my hand and spread them out as evenly as possible. And then from there, I just stack them on top of each other to help um, keep that moisture in. And as soon as they germinate, I will unstack them and put them under the grow lights and then by the end of the week, they're ready to harvest. One of the things that I found helpful with the sunflower shoots, um, because I was having a lot of trouble with the holes, getting them off when I harvested them, I was having them to pick a lot of them off one by one. So the first thing is the seed density. You really wanna make sure you're not going over that four and a half ounces per tray, because then you get pretty bad germination. Another thing is, is when I'm soaking them, um, I have them in like a little tray to soak them and I will put another tray on top of that to kind of push any of the floating seeds down into the water so they can get fully soaked. And then the second thing I do is once they're at about this stage, probably one more day, I'll take an empty tray and I'll do what's called a blackout stage and I'll just put this tray over that for a couple days and then um, after that, I'll lift it off and water it and I can lightly run my hands um, along the top like that and the seed holes will just fall right off. And so I will lightly water and do that every day after the blackout period and it helps immensely with getting the holes off before harvest. This is a germination chamber so it's just an old broken fridge that has a crock pot in the bottom and a thermostat. My neighbor helped me set it up. I don't know how he did it, but um, just for the stable temperatures, if you do have a busted fridge or a busted freezer or anything that could be contained like that, maybe it's a broken washer, uh, that could work too.